Prehistoric Australia was home to giant animals, but none were more mysterious than Thylacolio carnifex. This marsupial, nicknamed the marsupial lion, didn't follow any of the animal kingdom's rules. It lacked the canines of a cat and didn't look like a typical predator. Instead, it was a unique killing machine equipped with an extraordinary bite force and retractable claws. This is the story of how scientists gradually unraveled the mystery of one of history's most formidable predators and why it vanished forever. During the Ice Age, Australia's lost world was a unique ecosystem. Unlike the mammoths and saber-toothed cats, of the Northern Hemisphere, Australia had its own giant animals, including the rhinoceros-sized wombat relative to Protodon, the immense kangaroo Procoptodon, and the large bird Genyornis. Severe climate conditions, particularly prolonged aridity, forced these animals to evolve to a massive size to store energy and survive. Some of the best evidence of this ecosystem is found in limestone caves like Naracorte in South Australia, where sinkholes acted as natural traps for hundreds of thousands of years. Here, fossils of these megafauna are remarkably preserved, providing scientists with a rich catalogue of information about Australia's lost world. These giant, slow-moving herbivores created an abundant food source for Australia's apex predator crater, the marsupial lion, Thylacolio. That predator was Thylacolio carnifex, the marsupial lion. Its presence is remarkable not only because it filled the top of the food chain, but also because of where it came from. This family of animals traces back tens of millions of years to ancestors that lived in the dense rainforests of Riversley. From small tree climbing forebears evolved a line that gradually grew larger, specialized, and ultimately gave rise to the largest carnivorous marsupial of the Pleistocene. That deep lineage helps explain its unusual mix of features, claws, and grasping digits, hinting at an arboreal past paired with jaws capable of dispatching prey many times its size. Thylacolio was not just another predator fitted into a familiar mold. It was an apex hunter with tools no other mammal has carried. When paleontologists first examined its skull, they found something entirely unexpected. Instead of the long saber-like teeth of a big cat or rows of narrow canines like those of a wolf, the marsupial lion relied on a completely different arrangement. At the very front were a pair of oversized incisors that functioned as its gripping weapons, acting in place of the canines used by other carnivores. Behind them sat blade-shaped premolars that worked like shears snapping shut to slice through flesh and even cartilage with brutal efficiency. To the researchers staring at these bones, it looked less like the head of a mammal and more like a cutting machine designed for killing. This unusual design naturally raised questions about how it dealt with prey much larger than itself. Pound for pound studies indicate Thylacolio had one of the strongest bite forces of any known mammal. A specimen weighing around 101 kilograms could generate a bite comparable to that of a 250 kilogram African lion. That power came from a skull structured as a block of anchor points for its jaw muscles trading cranial space for crushing strength. Such force suggests the marsupial lion was not merely slicing soft tissue, it was capable of punching through hide, severing tendons and opening major vessels almost instantly. Yet the way it delivered the kill differed radically from the throat clamping strategy of big cats. Instead of suffocating its victims for minutes, 3D bite modeling indicates it probably used a rapid disabling bite, a quick stab and shear, leaving its prey mortally injured within moments of being struck. Comparisons with modern predators highlight just how alien this method was. Today's leopards, for example, dig their canines into the windpipe and hold tight until the animal succumbs. Their strength lies as much in endurance as in speed. Thylacolio lacked those long canines altogether. Its incisors pinned, its premolars sliced, and its extraordinary bite force delivered catastrophic damage in a short, decisive burst. In this way, it operated more as a butcher than a strangler, aiming not to wait out its prey's last breaths, but to cripple it almost instantly through trauma and blood loss. The skull, however, tells only half the story. Its four limbs were another set of weapons just as crucial to its hunting style. Each arm was compact and powerfully muscled with short, sturdy bones for leverage. At the end, the hands carried sharp, retractable claws and most notably a semi-opposable thumb tipped with an enlarged, hooked claw. 
Elbow morphology suggests this joint could rotate in ways that allowed it to grapple and twist, letting the clawed hands function almost like grasping grapples. This gave the marsupial lion a means of restraining prey in ways that placental predators could not. While a lion depends on clamping jaws as its main restraint, Thylacullio pinned victims with its arms first, then employed jaws designed to shear. Its body was in essence built for wrestling, anchoring and tearing in one movement. Computer modeling of its skull reinforces this picture of a predator specialized for sudden destructive strikes. Finite element analysis reveals that the skull was braced to withstand short bursts of enormous force optimized for rapid puncture and slicing rather than for prolonged pressure. The stresses it endured show that the animal's killing method was not about holding on, it was about impact. Jaw, closed bone, sheer tissue rupture. The whole sequence relied on precision and brief devastating bursts of energy. Imagine all these features working together in the split seconds of a hunt. The marsupial lion lunges from cover, heavy arms locking its hooked claws into an animal's hide. Using its strong shoulders and chest as anchors, it wrenches the struggling herbivore off balance. With the grip secured, its incisors drive in, while the shear-like premolars carve through skin and muscle. The hind limbs and stiff tail brace the assault, turning its whole body into a pivot. Prey that outweighed it many times over could be fatally disabled in less time than it would take a leopard to establish its suffocating bite. The efficiency of this system meant energy was spent in seconds rather than prolonged wrestling matches, aligning well with the demands of an arid environment where missed attempts carried high costs. When viewed in full thyla, Colio does not resemble any predator alive today. It was neither a marsupial copy of a saber tooth nor a scaled up possum. Every anatomical clue suggests a hunting strategy, all its own powerful forelimbs, to grapple a tail and pelvis designed to brace incisors that doubled as canines and premolars that acted like mechanical shears. This combination carved out an ecological role unlike that of any mammal on earth. But bones alone cannot tell the entire story. To see how these weapons played out in the real world, scientists have turned to the places where Thylacolio lived and dyed landscapes and caves that still hold the marks of its passage. Researchers have uncovered deep parallel scratches etched into limestone walls in sites such as Naracorte in South Australia and the Nullarbor Plain. Careful analysis shows that these grooves line up in spacing and depth with the claws of Thylacolio's powerful forelimbs, especially its enlarged thumb. Because many marks are found several meters above the ground, smaller animals can be ruled out. These are direct traces of behavior, not just inferences from anatomy. They tell us the marsupial lion moved vertically across rock faces using caves, not only as traps for the unwary, but also as part of its own life. For decades, the assumption was that Thylacolio's body plan made it too heavy and rigid to climb. Its broad chest, shortened spine, and robust arms looked cumbersome compared with the agile builds of leopards or clouded leopards, but the scratches forced a reassessment. Tracing their paths upward along sheer stone, sometimes soaring toward the cave ceiling, researchers concluded the marsupial lion possessed enough leverage and grip to scale hard surfaces. The spacing of the claw marks matched hand anatomy, reconstructed from fossil bones, reinforcing that these marsupials were not awkward ground ambushers, but muscular climbers that relied on power rather than agility. Juvenile activity is also recorded in stone. Some clusters of scratches sit much lower at heights, reachable only by smaller individuals. The density of these shallower marks suggests repeated play climbing or practice behavior consistent with dens where mothers sheltered offspring. As young Thylacolio outgrew the pouch caves, may have provided enclosed defensible spaces for early trials of balance and strength. This interpretation expands the picture of the caves, not simply accident sites where animals fell, but living spaces that held family groups. In them, the predator's nurturing strategies become visible in faint gouges along rock walls. Skeletal discoveries support these behavioral clues. New material, including clavicles and caudal vertebrae, indicates the animal's tail was stiffened, reinforced with chevrons, and anchored its posture. 
Combined with the clavicles linking the shoulders across the chest, this anatomy permitted a tripod stance balanced on hind legs and tail while freeing the forelimbs for grappling. Imagine the marsupial lion braced upright arms striking outward or reaching onto rough vertical surfaces. This tripod posture fits neatly with the climbing marks, explaining how the animal could steady itself during ascent or hold position while wrestling large prey. Researchers have also noted the possibility of caching behavior. The size and placement of some scratch marks suggest that larger adults struggled upward with weight, perhaps dragging a carcass or its parts into elevated cavities. Because the marsupial lion was not a fast pursuit hunter, protecting a hard won kill would have been critical. Some scientists suggest as a hypothesis that it may have stashed meat in alcoves or crevices similar to the kill hoarding behavior of leopards today. While unproven, the idea aligns with both the anatomy of its claws and the practical need to prevent scavengers from stealing meals in a competitive environment. Taken together, the marks transform caves into records of daily life. They show climbing not as a rare maneuver, but as a regular skill. They capture young individuals testing their strength in places protected from open country dangers. They hint at meals pulled away from hyenas or vultures counterparts, which in Pleistocene Australia were giant reptiles and other scavengers. Unlike fossilized bones, which show only what an animal was made of, these grooves demonstrate what it did. Every scratched wall is a preserved gesture of behavior frozen in stone. The picture is of a predator with deliberate habits and tactical strategies. Thylacolio raised its young in sheltered sites, balanced upright on a reinforced skeleton and may have prepared ambushes or stored food where rivals could not reach. Evidence from claws and caves reveals that this was not an accident prone scavenger, but a focused hunter that used its environment to maximum advantage. Yet for all its adaptations, the record ends abruptly. The same caves that display their marks also chart their disappearance with later layers, missing signs of the marsupial lion. An apex predator so specialized and seemingly secure did not survive into recent millennia, leaving scientists to ask why. Thylacolio disappears from the record around 46,000 to 50,000 years ago, a loss that coincides with one of the most debated extinction episodes in Australia's history. Its demise came during the same window when much of the continent's megafauna vanished, raising the question of what combination of forces pushed this powerful predator past the point of survival. What current evidence shows is that no single cause stands alone. The late Pleistocene was already a period of severe environmental stress. Expanding aridity turned lakes into salt pans, woodlands into dry scrub and grazing grounds into patchier, less reliable landscapes. Large herbivores like Diprototone and the giant kangaroo Procoptodon, which had once provided the caloric base for Thylacolio, began to decline in numbers. With their disappearance, the marsupial lion faced a diet gap it couldn't easily bridge. A hunter adapted to wrestle multi-ton prey could not simply downshift to small wallabies. The mathematics of energy intake made that strategy unsustainable. Archaeological and paleoenvironmental studies complicate this story further. At Naracorte and the Willandra Lakes, for example, some herbivore populations show signs of stress or decline even before dense archaeological evidence appears. This indicates that climate-driven changes were already weakening ecosystems. Yet Australia's fauna had endured previous ice age cycles without full collapse. That makes human arrival an important part of the picture, not as the sole driver, but as the new variable that coincided with the final contractions. Human influence likely came through multiple pathways. One plausible mechanism is the deliberate use of fire to manage vegetation, sometimes called fire stick farming. By burning patches to encourage fresh growth, early people could create mosaics that favored smaller game, but reduce the forage needed by mega herbivores. At a time when rainfall was already retreating, fires may have amplified ecological stress. Mass die-offs were not required to destabilize food chains. A shift in plant communities alone would have been enough to weaken the large grazers on which predators relied. Direct hunting cannot be ruled out, but the evidence is limited. No unambiguous kill sites link Thylacoleo directly with human tools or butchery marks. This absence means human hunting is plausible in a supporting role, but not conclusively proven in isolation. Even so, the dynamic of low reproduction in giant herbivores is well documented. 
A few extra kills per decade set against the background of dwindling habitats could push populations below recovery thresholds. That fragility meant every external stressor mattered more than it might have in past climatic swings. Paleoecological records reinforce this sense of overlap. Charcoal layers rise in sediments soon after human arrival, but it remains debated how widespread or patchy the burning was. Pollen studies show vegetation restructuring across multiple regions, some linked to climate trends and others potentially to fire. Meanwhile, dated fossils confirm a gradual reduction in megafauna long before the final disappearance. Together, these strands point to a scenario where neither climate nor people in isolation explain the outcome. Instead, the most consistent picture is a synergy long-term drying that cut ecosystem resilience compounded by human disturbance that arrived just as populations were already stressed. This multi-causal view reaches beyond thylacolio alone. Fossils of other megafauna show the same staggered collapses. Deprotodon, giant kangaroos, and flightless birds all faded before or during that same 46,000 to 50,000 year range. The marsupial lion's decline, therefore, was not the downfall of a single species, but part of a broader unraveling of large animal communities. Its disappearance mirrors theirs because its survival was tied directly to theirs. Apex predators can only dominate while the web beneath them is intact. Seen this way, the extinction of Thylacolio was not simply the loss of a formidable hunter, but the erasure of an entire ecological stage. Climate squeezed resources, humans reshaped landscapes, and herbivore foundations crumbled. Each force alone would have strained survival. Together, they reinforced one another until even the continent's most specialized predator could not endure. What remains is a reminder of how finely balanced ecosystems are when their largest players set the rhythm. The marsupial lion exemplifies how apex hunters thrive only so long as the structure below them holds steady, the a truth that gives its story resonance right the far top. beyond the Pleistocene. Thelicolio stands as a reminder of how evolution builds specialists. It was a uniquely adapted ambush predator, powerful in its jaws and forelimbs, not in speed, sculpted by the massive herbivores of Ice Age Australia. Its disappearance, about 46,000 to 50,000 years ago, underscores how tightly predators depend on both their prey and the habitats that sustain them. That lesson remains relevant today as modern apex species face pressures from shrinking ranges and altered ecosystems. If this blend of anatomy and uh, paleoecology interests you, tell us in the comments which uh, Pleistocene Australian animal you want the next deep dive on.